So, dann herzlich willkommen zurück. Welcome back from coffee or whatever you do at home or in the office. Um, I see that everyone is already online. We will now come to the next big issue that we defined last year uh, when we defined big issues on, on the German economy and the, uh, on the renewal of the German model. We've been talking about inequality to recall. We've been talking about fiscal policy and debt break, which is an important subject. And uh, now the last session was about the export model, very central. And they all have some elements of this next session, which is about uh, the issue, the, the challenge to the German economy from the transition to a carbon neutral economy, from other aspects which are more structural, which are all uh, posing the question or coming back to the question of how to design a, an optimal industrial policy. We commissioned the study, uh, this study, which is the third or fourth that we're now talking about, the fourth, um, uh, from the team of Mariana Mazzucato, Uh, and her team in, in London, which for us was a very exciting opportunity because we could uh, so and again ask people a little bit from the outside to and someone like Mariana, uh, who is very excellent on, on redefining the role of the state and, and thinking about these issues and asking them to work on the German industrial policy was an opportunity which, is, which was huge and which makes, I mean, Getting out of the German bubble was very helpful, and we now have the opportunity to do, to listen to the study, to the results of the study, and discuss them with very important German um, speakers. I hand over to uh, Jens, who is online. I mean, uh, a little unfortunately, but due to the current times, uh, this session also has shifted a lot more to, to the virtual side. Uh, Jens has decided not to come to Berlin. Uh, Klaus Deutsch couldn't come uh, to to the to the uh, event uh, today, so please, Jens, uh, I hand over to you to um, introduce uh, the speakers and the discussion. Yeah. And we uh, need to say that Mariana apologizes for not being able to present herself at last minute, uh, which is very unfortunate. But Rainer Cutler, who has worked essentially with her on the study, will present the study and. Uh, transmit any suggestion to Mariana afterwards. So Jens, please. Yeah, so thanks Thomas. And uh, yeah, well, apologize uh, for not being around in Berlin, but I decided that Berlin is too unsafe at the time. And so I'm safe here in Düsseldorf, but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to chair this session. Um, so we're gonna have uh, Raina presenting the paper um, and also convey the apologies from Mariana for not being able to present. And so we'll have uh, three comments on the paper later on. And we're going to start with Philip Steinberg from the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs. And I think I've seen him in the audience already. So he's, he's there physically. Then afterwards, Patricia uh, Nanz from the German French Forum and uh, Klaus Deutsch from the um, Federation of German Industries. So, but uh, yeah, let's directly jump into the topic and we look forward to uh, the presentation by Rainer. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, let me just um, share my screen and I hope it works um, both virtually and also um, digitally, uh, I'm sorry, physically in Berlin and, and also apologies for, um, for not being there. Uh, I think it's quite difficult at the moment to travel from UK uh, to Germany without being stuck for two weeks um, in some hotel probably. So uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunate as it is. Yeah, so we were um, our team and you can see our members uh, of the team who did the research for this paper. And again, yeah, Mariana apologizes for, for not being here in person. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through sort of the main findings of, of our paper. And uh, I think already the title of the, of the session, the German industrial policy role model or end of the cycle in itself sort of provides you actually the answer as well, because it, it is sort of both. So the, in, in many ways, uh, we see that in Germany, the industrial policy of the, of the post-war era is sort of coming to, to the end. Um, but, at the same, and there, but at the same time, there is also something new emerging, which uh, perhaps has flown slightly under the radar, uh, but where the, there is much more sort of an active um, and focused role of the state. So let me just go through the, through the slides here. So, um, yep. So of course, even pre-COVID pre, you know, pre world, there was a, 
a, a quite a bit of discussion around the industrial policy. You see this is uh, in Germany, you had uh, two years ago, the, the new industrial policy discussions around uh, mainly actually geopolitical uh, issues between you know, Germany and Europe being between, stuck between US and China in terms of not having the industrial giants anymore, especially in the digital sphere. But then of course you have, uh, you know, also in the, in the Anglo-American world and in the, in the World Bank and other places, the industrial policy was all of a sudden seen as an important policy arena. I think partially it has to do with, uh, with, the, with the void left by, by, on the other hand, sort of focusing on science and technology policies and then uh, on, the, on the other hand, on macroeconomic stability. So there was nothing much in between those kind of policies that, that we saw over the last 30 years where countries were really focusing on. And I think this was already uh, over the last couple of years, you saw it both in Germany, but also in Anglo-American debate, of course, this becoming more and more important. And then of course with COVID, you see here a, 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 a pro from an economist, but also in the Spiegel, you saw this uh, very positive debates actually around much more activist role of the state. And I think this really has to do with this idea that there's an increasing realization about that markets are not only sort of finding the direction of economic growth by themselves, but this, this is also co-shaped by public policy actors in, in, in essence that innovation is political. So it's, it is political decision in what kind of energy technologies, for instance, we invest into, or what kind of, um, how do we eat, how do we uh, go about cities, transportation, all that. It, these are larger political issues. And I think this realization the public policy is not only about enabling growth, but public policy is also very much about what kind of growth we want, sort of the, what kind of direction of the growth we want. And this is, uh, has then sort of come down into the debate around industrial innovation policies, where it's very much about, you know, if, if you look back over the 1990s and two, 2000s, early 2000s, the focus of the role of the state was very much around create and diffuse knowledge. So you have investment into research, investment into applied research, looking at regulatory frameworks, that knowledge is actually being uh, diffused throughout uh, sectors under economy, but also looking at education and, and things like that. And there's, then there is also increasingly now the, sort of the focus and we understand that actually we can, through industrial and innovation policies, try to solve specific challenges like the climate emergency. And, and this is here a, a sort of just to show you how the, and I'm sure all of you know that, how the prices of energy have come radically down over the last uh, really 10 years uh, and, uh, and across the board uh, of uh, prices of renewable energy. So, and this is of course where the German uh, investment, especially in the sort of photovoltaic industry and Chinese as well, was so uh, important in terms of crowding in. And I think this is really the behind the, uh, uh, the rise of industrial policy, the realization that a lot of these markets are actually shaped or co-shaped by, by public uh, action as well. And so we need to look into that. And of course, in, in Germany, you have a, a, this sort of debate of industrial policy, not only the geopolitical issues, if you will, but there is also, of course, the, uh, we, we heard about this in the morning as well, the, uh, the problems with inequality, if you will, the inequality challenge. And here is just a, a if you see the if you look at South Korea, basically the, there's a market uh, income gene index and the disposable income gene index are very close by. In Germany, they are actually very much apart, which means that to keep the inequality relatively low, it's, it's getting more and more expensive in time. That means there is lack of high paying uh, jobs and whatnot. So you have a, a huge, enormous challenge there. And then the other one is from the Belsesman system. You see the study that 20 years ago, Germany used to be much more at the forefront at least in terms of patents, in terms of uh, looking at the future key technologies. There is obviously some sort of uh, challenge there. And so this is the, if you look at the sort of the post-war German industrial policy consensus, if you will, uh, what uh, a very well-known German historian has called uh, uh, in the Ordnungspolit der Sichtbaren Hand, is the visible hand of the order liberal policies. And what we did here is basically a look at the private sector investment into R&D, which is the greener uh, you go, uh, the more private sector investment there is, and then the concentration of uh, basically public research institutions. And you see, if you take away the East Germany from here, you see in the, in the West German case, this, this worked quite well. You had this public sector investing into knowledge and applied research and also educational institutions and private sector uh, focusing on, on R&D investment and developing incrementally very much the, the, the industrial base. I think this was indeed uh, the sort of the existing model in Germany. I think that, uh, that also in the title of the session, it's a 
end of the cycle, I think, in very much or some uh, in somewhat is, is that you see here. But on the other end, you have to say it is still working really well. Germany is uh, at you know number one or number two exporter in the world, mostly industrial goods. So obviously, there is something going really well there as well. So you can't argue that this is not working. And, and on the other hand, you see that there is in Germany, um, you have on increasing attention being paid to missions or challenges and policies that, that should solve specific missions. So you have on the one hand, of course, the very well known NRK Vendor over the last 20 years, and especially the role of KFW in that. You see the rapid increase of KSW investment into green uh, environmental technologies, uh, and of course played an enormous role in, 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 in getting those prices down of, of energy, renewable energy carriers. But then also you have a high-tech high policy or so-called high-tech policy 2025 that really actually uh, mentions 12 specific missions for Germany. And this has become very much a coordinating strategy for the R&D and, uh, and, and innovation. There's some research from the Fraunhofer Institute that shows where, which, which, which kind of missions these are. So basically most of German current science and technology and innovation investment should fall under those missions one way or another. And some of them are more concrete, like you know, trying to combat cancer, but others are much less concrete, like open science and circular economy that are very much also not about only research, but also behavioral aspects of it, if you will. So there is, you can see there is a, a very significant shift going on in Germany, both through the energy vendor, but also in a wider policy coordination a way of looking at innovation industrial policies and saying that those policies should be focusing on quite specific topics and try to solve them rather than just leave the market to find the direction. So in that sense, yes, we are at the end of a cycle and at the beginning of a new one, but, uh, uh, but it is quite interesting how this new one will work because these uh, policy documents are also like two years old, basically. So this is very much at the beginning of it. And also if you look at the COVID response, you see again, here is uh, from energy policy tracker, there is an attempt to basically classify uh, where does uh, Germany's COVID response packages go in terms of climate and energy. And if you look, uh, Germany is, is sort of leading in the world in terms of green <sighs> additional support to industry. So again, you see the energy vendor, the mission-oriented focus of energy vendor is actually working quite well, uh, even in, in the COVID responses. And you can argue that this, this, this is, again, is, is, a, is a clear sort of a, uh, emergence of a new model, if you will. And then if he, what we did in, in, in the paper is to look at the wider economic policy landscape. And of course, this is where the, you know, the Mariana's original uh, uh, contribution came from initially uh, in, the, in the entrepreneurial state, is the idea that finance is never really neutral, that all the sort of financial structure of the economy is working one way or another to support innovation, or it's, it's, it's actually not. And so along the sort of innovation chain, and so this is what, is, uh, that what we did in, in German case as well. And, and really what is really surprising in a German case is that you have a, a sort of the really the largest financial leverage in the economy are at the moment seemingly funding a carbon locking actually. So you have this massive sort of investment from the KFW, COVID, what, whatever, it, all of those areas in, in science and technology as well. But on the other hand, you have a, a procurement budget, which is, which is a massive budget from the government. And so we looked at green, green procurement. So it's a really a minor segment uh, of, of procurement is actually so helping to, to, to tackle climate emergency, for instance. So essentially you have left this sort of a source, uh, if you will, un, unused in the economy. And of course, not all procurement can be green, not all, all procurement can support innovation, but it, it can clearly be more than a couple of percentage points, especially given how much of that is done uh, uh, in, in construction and in, in areas where, which are really relevant for the uh, climate emergency. And the same goes for the uh, Bundesbank and uh, the way the Bundesbank purchases on the market uh, through quantitative easing and other programs. And again, we look, where does this money go? And, and you can't really find in data that shows which is green or not technology, but you, you see that it goes into leading sectors of the German economy, which sort of makes sense, of course, that it goes to automated and parts and chemicals and others. But again, you can arguably um, look at it and say, well, perhaps the, uh, the sort of the regulation and the investment through the Bundesbank can be can do much more, uh, especially if you look at the green, the private banking or uh, financing is actually quite lower in Germany. So there's obviously this wide resources in, in the economy that haven't been really deployed in the you know green or other sort of missions that the German government or the policymakers at the federal level have already set. 
a couple of years ago. And I think so to, to come at the, at the conclusion of, of our paper, you can really see that there is an there is this overarching attempt to find a consensus among policymakers that yes, we should focus on, on, on mission and challenges, but at, and at the same time, you see that most of this funding is still sort of focused on knowledge creation, knowledge diffusion, which you know has worked really well in the past. But I think the really the challenge for policymakers is how do we um, you know combine these federal high level strategic choices and missions with those you know, mundane, everyday R&D that takes place both in public institutions and in private institutions, which is very much still focusing on those, uh, you know, the order liberal uh, ways of, of, of visible hand, if you will. So it's, 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 a, it's a fusion of these two body policy models. And on the other hand, you have this, yes, COVID and, and of course, COLEX, it will take much more time. There's a lot of funding coming there as well. And these are much more trying to focus on climate emergency and industrial upgrading, but again, the linkages uh, to the, to the R&D policy are where the, where the real questions are, are being asked, I, guess, I think. And then, uh, as I said, we have this uh, largely unused levers in the economy. You have the Bundesbank um, working together with the ECB. Uh, and, and then, of course, you, you also have the, the uh, procurement budget. And, and you really have to ask, what are the sort of policies and strategic ways of looking at these enormous source resources in the economy that are essentially unused for, for these kind of uh, strategic choice, choices. And of course, not all of those actions can be, uh, for instance, deployed for green, but some of it can. And so how do we get uh, these resources deployed also in the, in, the, in, the, in the purpose for these, or fulfilling these kind of promises and choices? And I think this is really, for the next decade or so, one of the key uh, questions for German in, in industrial policymaking, if you will. And, and just to sort of bring an example of how other countries are, are looking at doing that. Uh, and as I, as I showed in Germany, you have 12 missions uh, by the federal, federal government, but some of them are really quite vague, like for instance, open science, which, you know, it's, it's a nice thing, but doesn't really uh, inspire or motivate anybody to do anything different. And here is, a, here is an example from Sweden, which I think is uh, especially the first mission that the Swedish Innovation Agency we know is working on which shares that in you know, the Sweden, we, we, we try to ensure that every student in Sweden eats healthy, sustainable, tasty food, which means every school lunch, basically, which is government funded mostly in Sweden, is you know, healthy, sustainable, and tasty, which means you have to get together large food industry. You have to think about how much, what do you in, in, import? How do we eat? How, does this, how is this procured? So it has all the components in there, but it's also provide this behavioral change you want to see in consumer habits in terms of eating healthy, eating local, eating um, from renewable sources in terms of energy and all that. So there is, an, there is a much better way of, of trying to formulate these missions than, than it's done at the moment in Germany, where you, where you sort of have the feeling that these are in some ways quite rhetorical uh, you know, coordination tools rather than actual sort of industrial policy levers. And so in terms of our recommendations and, and I'll, 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 I'll end here, we sort of developed three recommendations, which are really about not just policies, but we're actually much more about public sector capabilities. Where does Germany need to look for to develop new or different kinds of capabilities in public sector? And of course, the first one is, is very much around this uh, sort of coordination capabilities between those federal level missions, which are there, which are, there are 12 of them, as I said, and then really this much more regional uh, focused industrial and knowledge clusters between public institutions and private industry. Let's not forget, private industry is the main funder of R&D in Germany. So you have to be able to coordinate uh, this action uh, in a much better way than now, because currently these are really supported, you know, essentially through mission neutral and technology neutral policy. I think Germany must, German must be the only language to really have the world which is technology neutral. So it's, uh, it's, nobody else has really that word, I guess. And even it's made up, but it's still, it's really interesting that you have this word uh, and to describe these policies. And then I think the real capability is to look at the financial sector and sort of how do we uh, sort of motivate and crowd in financial investments into the, into the green transition, and, and, but also into the other missions. Because again, today, if you look at the central bank operations and financial instruments, they're large in technology and mission neutral. And the question is whether we can afford that, looking at Germany's challenges that I, came, uh, that I talked about in the, in the beginning, 
inequality and, and, and lagging behind the key technologies. And then, of course, looking at, the, looking at the procurement, again, the legal environment actually allows procurement officers to go for the greenest project, to go for a most innovative project, if you will. But this is not done because of the various uh, limitations in terms of capabilities of actually, of, of actually doing that. So I think areas should be patients the gears to focus for, for German policymakers and also the uh, and various discussions around that policy. So these are just some of the resources that you can uh, find on our website as well, but looking forward to the debate. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rainer. Um, so I'll suggest we'll start with the comments by um, Philipp Steinberg, directly from Berlin. Okay, can everybody hear me? Hi, Jens. I hope to see you here. So I, I, I appeared here on the, in person. Um, it's a bit lonely on the stage, actually. Oh, very um, sorry, Philip. Next time. <laughs> there are people in the room, so that's, uh, that's helpful to, to reassure me. So, so thank you very much, Rainer, for, for this really stimulating uh, uh, paper. Um, I, I mean, in, in a way, I, I would like to, maybe for the sake of the argument as well, but uh, frame it a little bit differently. I mean, in my view, um, obviously, you're ta talking a lot about innovation policy, and there, obviously, we are we are at the center of the question: What is industrial policy? What is the role of the state? So, in in a way, I mean, you know, it's there's no argument about it. Even like you know, in in conservative German auto liberal um, uh, theory, in a way, there's there's a, there's a case for the state getting involved in innovation policy. So that's my 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 first uh, first point. So basically, yes. I would agree with a lot of what you said, but so why much is, is, is why much but why, why talk so much about it? That is nothing nothing really new. That was your my first remark. Second remark, uh, then of course um, you you argued um, in your paper a little bit more than in your presentation. Now you said, okay, is COVID a game changer? Okay, it was not only COVID you talked about, you talked about high, high, the high tech strategy, you talked about KFW and the involvement of our public bank, KFW, actually it's the mission of KFW, as has always been, to get in, involved um, uh, here. So basically my argument, and that is actually my, my, my central argument, is that all those developments that you have highlighted actually result mainly from the main challenges we are facing, we are faced with today. What is that? That's of course digitalization, the platform economy we have to deal with, we have to find, find answers to. There are, of course, um, um, uh, coordination problems, which have, that's, that's a classical theoretical uh, coordination problems as, as a case for the involvement of the state. And they are, of course, like strengthened a lot um, by, uh, uh, by this uh, uh, digitalization strategies or digitalization tendencies, which are st strengthened a lot uh, by, uh, by, or highlighted a lot, a lot by, uh, uh, by COVID. So digitalization, first uh, driver of change and giving rise to more, maybe more involvement of the state, not only, but also in innovation pol uh, policy. Second, of course, the climate crisis, the external costs are one of the classical arguments, of course, to justify the involvement of the state here. I would argue, once again, this has become even more clearer. Therefore, of course, in a way, we need to, we need to uh, establish mechanisms. We have started in Germany, of course, with our CO2 pricing scheme. In spite of the criticisms, at least we have started. So I think that's, that's another, another um, uh, argument. And then, of course, or another reason. And then the third but a um, big challenge we are seeing today, once again highlighted by the COVID crisis, is of our, of course, changing geopolitic, ge ge geopolitics. That's basically um, value change. The, the, the question, do, does, do we, can we still live with this highly, highly integrated um, model? And of course, we in the economics ministry, we still believe in the division of labor, but also, and that's what uh, Peter Altmaier always keeps, uh, keeps on mentioning, saying, of course, we have to, to be mindful of changing value creation in today's, uh, today's uh, society. That means, of course, if, if a car is not, not the engine anymore, but it's the battery and it's the, 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 um, the software, then we have to actually um, uh, live, live up to that. So basically what, what I'm, I'm saying is, is that um, I, I think your, your study in a way is, 
is, is, is, is, is highlighting important developments. Um, but in a way, they can, the answer can be described really using more or less conventional, uh, conventional um, uh, methodology, using uh, like external costs, internalization of inter external costs, talking about coordination problems. Yes, we have stronger coordination problems today um, with high fixed costs for especially digital infrastructure and uh, uncertain, un uncertain demand for, for it. We have the S-curve uh, dilemma, of course, uh, that means actually to, that we have to actually get the, the innovation into the real economy. And that is all a case, yes, where the state is, is, is needed uh, as, a, as an innovator, as somebody who is uh, who's, who's, uh, um, who's actively uh, taking, uh, uh, playing, playing by, by the rules. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it, that is, I wouldn't call it a paradigm sh shift. I would just say we use, we, we look at the, at, what, at the developments, at the challenges we are facing, and then we, we, we need to, to find the, the right um, answers. Just to, to quickly, to, to, to sum up, uh, uh, coming to your recommendations, you said we need a more mission-orientated approach to structural change. Well, in a way, I mean, I'm responsible for, for, this, for structural change for the Coal Commission, um, the 40 billion uh, law. I mean, I would call it a, a mission-oriented approach in a way. I mean, our mission is to, uh, to help the structural change to take place, decarbonization to take place. So, I mean, I would call this, this a mission-oriented uh, approach, even there's a lot of criticism actually leveled against it because what many say uh, it would have been better to use uh, CO2 pricing schemes in a, in a more efficient way. But so I would say we are doing that. Then you mentioned finance. Finance, of course, um, there are, of course, there's the debate about the role of the central banks. But considering the credit sector, I mean, we, in Germany, we have a very, very vivid de debate about sustainable finance. We have a sustainable finance Beirat, who is very active and you want to become one of the leading sustainable finance hubs in Europe. So I would argue actually, here we have actually, we have already answered to your call. And on public procurement, once again, um, uh, my responsibility in the ministry, I mean, this 500 billion figure is a little bit, it gets higher and higher, I'm not quite sure, um, uh, but uh, be it 300 or 500 billion, yes, it can serve, and we are working on, in it, on it to, to make it more efficient. To be, uh, I'm, I'm working on a, on a strategy, on a public procurement strategy for Germany. Uh, still, I mean, a lot of uh, procurement is just, you know, uh, the stuff you need. So I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on it, but it can be, of course, um, um, one, uh, one element. So, so to sum up, I would, I would think, you, yes, your study is, is highlighting a lot of, 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 of trends. I wouldn't call it a paradigm uh, uh, change. I would just uh, call it uh, we, are, we are answering to the challenges uh, of today's economy. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I suggest to hand it over to Patricia for her comments. Yes. Um, thank you, Jens. Thank you, Rainer, for your fascinating presentation. And um, thanks to everyone for having organized this great event and for inviting me to this panel. Can you hear me or are there any technical problems? Okay, great. So um, I'm a sustainability researcher and therefore by, very, by its very definition, I'm interested, um, as you might um, understand quite quickly, uh, in grand and complex and wicked challenges. So all of you are aware that uh, with our current living and, and producing uh, styles, we are producing climate change and loss of biodiversity, agricultural devastation to change just a few. These, pair, uh, these problems urgently need large scale solutions at a very fast, uh, fast pace. And therefore, as you can imagine, I'm very much in favor and very sympathetic of, to the mission oriented approach to economic policy put forward in this uh, IIPP report and Rhinus presentation. So when it comes to big transformations ahead of us, it will not be sufficient, to my view, to just incrementally change established models of economic development and hope for the best. Huh? So the mission-oriented approach offers a very strong, I think, conceptual and empirical uh, framework for more thorough transformation of economic governance. It's a timely proposal that helps us to to rethink, strengthen, and integrate the structure of economic governance in Germany and elsewhere. That said, I would like to raise some questions to this report and to every one of you at the panel and in the, in the, um, in the public. Uh, namely, um, the question um, to, with regard to the actual implementation of the mission-oriented approach. 
My view implementing such an approach would also require to not only to substitute mission neutral governance uh, mechanisms and institution to new mission oriented mechanisms, it would also be imperative, imperative to integrate economic policy through a cross sexual coordination and to build close collaboration between government and willing economic actors in order to co shape the direction of growth. This is a bit more than what Philip Steinberg called. Uh, it's not. It's more than just a question. Uh, I, I think of coordination problems, and let me explain why. Um, as a political scientist, I'm in particular interested uh, in not only how these general ideas you put forward translate in the in practices of the real world. Uh, so I'm not only interested in, con in concepts, but really what's happening. And given that for the last four years I have been sort of more a policy advisor than a researcher only. I have many insights with, with how ministry works, how bureaucracy works, and what the difficulties are also in the coal regions. I'll explain that later. Um, so if you go back to, to your um, report, uh, you state, a uh, quote, that it, we would need to, quote, build more robust dynamic um, capabilities of public organizations, end quote. So among others, the report refers to capabilities to engage with a wide set of social actors, to encourage bottom-up engagement, what we do, by the way, in the French-German Zukunftswerk, and uh, for experimentation and for cross-departmental collaboration. These are very strong, uh, how can I say, bold um, statements, and I think we are far from there. Um, so I can, of course, emphatically agree with this idea, but in my opinion, these capabilities of collaborations are not only decisive, but very difficult to establish. Uh, so establishing these capabilities and corresponding structures, not only the capabilities and cultures of collaborations, are crucial. Uh, and I, since I'm a member of the High Tech Forum uh, for the High Tech um, Strategy 2025, uh, I can I can say that you are right that if if you want the strategy to be um, not only a mere paper tiger, but be an effective strategy or turn any form of isolated innovative agency or institution into a powerful agent, we need this transformation. We need a transformation of government. Yeah, uh, and this transformation of government in itself is a huge challenge. So what we need in a nutshell is a systemic change within government and administration toward cooperation and openness. Such a, ch a change, of course, uh, would not only uh, sort of uh, apply to relevant or relevant for um, economic policy, but more widely, it's a more widely condition for effective governance of big transformation in general. So it's bigger than only the economic questions. And I think that most political institutions at the moment, to my view, are not fit for purpose with regard to big challenges ahead. Um, so I think there's a, strategy, there's a striking analogy uh, from what you cite in the report, namely that in the same way that mission neutral mechanisms and institutions of economic policy tend to result in a lock-in of existing carbon intensive industries, existing capabilities and institutional structures in government and administration lock in certain approaches and models of policy making. And that's what makes it particularly hard to establish new approaches and models, to my view. Yeah. So with regard to the German Kohleausstieg or coal exit, uh, I think it's a, potential, uh, it's a potential trigger for mission-oriented economic policy. And I think that Philip Steinberg agrees with that probably, and it hints at the fact that political decision makers are trying to copy the regional research and industry clusters established in the Western, uh, in Western Germany, for example, the, the Rhein-Revier, Rheinisches Revier, to the region. Uh, but I'm, for the last four years, I have been very often allowed, because that's why, where some of my projects, my research projects are, and to my view, um, this would be very difficult, because in the, the structural conditions in the West, have been established um, over the last decades since World War II, and they are very different from, from the Lauditz, for example, Lusatia, which is south of, of, of Berlin. Uh, so I fear that, for example, to just state this Lauditz uh, example, I fear that as a mission-oriented approach to structural change in Lusatia would also require a huge collaborative effort between politics, business, and civil society. Uh, only, for example, I, I can, can say that in the discussion, if you want, I can elaborate on this. Um, 
I think that the, the, the question of middle outflows, fund outflow is, is a big issue, how to, how to uh, have a meaningful process uh, for, for this middle outflows. But I can elaborate on this later. So um, to come back to my um, um, example in, in Lusatia, um, the emission approach uh, to coal exit would of, it's, it's of course clear, we will have to go out coal by 2032. Um, but the clear problem in the region is not simply a loss of jobs that depend directly or indirectly on coal production. Uh, it's also, to put it in a nutshell, that in Lusatia, the coal has been a knot, not only of economic, but also social and political coexistence uh, for many centuries. And so it's, 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 it's profoundly woven into the, the history and the, and the cultural uh, identity of these people. And they have also experienced many sort of disappointments after reunification, new conflicts, old, for, old con conflicts in this um, structural change. And therefore, I think that's why they are quite prone to be um, disregarding now uh, parliamentary democracy in turn to right-wing populism, which is of course a big danger, I think, for, for German democracy. Uh, so it's, it's a very complex issue I want to stress. It's not only an economic issue. Um, and, and therefore, if we want to transform Lusatia uh, with a broad mission, uh, we would need a more comprehensive model for the future of the entire region, right? This would encompass not only economic, but also ecological, political, and cultural aspects. And such a comprehensive model would need, of course, uh, to be broader, not only to economic policy, but also, as I said before, to questions how to work across sectors, uh, with civil society and even with citizens. To, so to summarize, what I want to say is, is really that um, is, uh, the role of the state is, is quite crucial. And I think that um, Philip Steinbeck mentioned that, that uh, in Germany, I think that digitalization is the key uh, to think about the role of the state and perhaps uh, to see digitalization as driver of change. But I see, for example, much more debate on how the state and administration uh, have to change for transformation in France, for example. It's not only a question of the reform of INA in UK now by the LSE in Sweden, how to, how to make sure that, uh, how to tackle these challenges cross sector, et cetera, et cetera. But I see very little, uh, little debate on, on, on this in Germany. Uh, and if we, if, if you agree that the bottleneck of structural change uh, is the, the reform also of, uh, of, of administration and, uh, and the government itself to be handlow stakes, so to be sort of apt for, for the transformation we are facing, uh, then we should put much more, um, uh, how can I say, attention to this part of the implementation of any sort of policymaking. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's pass it on to Klaus for uh, his comments. Well, uh, thank you. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you because I was only cleared two hours uh, ago for not being COVID positive, and so I had to stay at home. Uh, you see flowers rather than my fridge in the kitchen. Please excuse me for not being present. Let me make uh, five quick arguments. The one is a historical one. I think in terms of thinking about um, German industrial policy, one has to start with uh, destroying the misconception that there hasn't been one in the post-war period. I think we had a, a very large uh, set of industrial policies that are often are forgotten and are talked about in the political science literature as actually a system involving collective bargaining, the restructuring of firms by banks, the uh, politics of productivity, with uh, companies uh, devoting their energies to um, uh, accepting high wages and promoting innovation and a set of industrial relations that allowed uh, the management of uh, you know, structural transformation and the increasing international division of labor. We also had sta uh, single, single states on, you know, not the federal level, but states who devised their education systems in ways uh, that helped to um, set up professional education um, and uh, R&D systems to support value creation, employment, and industry. This is all uh, standard knowledge and should be reflected in the paper. We also had a number of very important industrial policies in the past in Germany, starting with the um, 
uh, well, essentially with nuclear policy and the creation of the nuclear industry, uh, then moving over to Airbus and the air and space field. Uh, we had a huge regional structural policy issue in the war area stretching from the 80s to today. We did have in the coal government a very large number of policies that were then, uh, you know, uh, fashioned under the rubric of technology policy, setting up biotech regions in Germany and so on. And we had an increasing attention to um, horizontal technology policies with the emergence of several high-tech funds um, uh, and uh, associated structures of finance. Uh, we have now Coparian, KW Capital, we will soon have a fund for risk capital and so on. And then of course, we had the huge exercise that was studies from everywhere on uh, introducing renewable energy in a large scale, which is probably the biggest exercise in industrial policy we have done in Germany. So we don't start from scratch, but I agree with the paper that it was often not well communicated. It didn't have a clear cut of objective and uh, often uh, people did it in the dark, uh, being shy of being criticized in the media for messing in industrial uh, relations or industrial affairs more generally. Now what's going on right now is a return to a stronger industrial policy that comes from broader policy objectives the uh, government sets itself uh, together with other European countries that I highlight only three. One is climate change and the associated decarbonization of industry that has to go along with that. The second one is uh, the strength and resilience in healthcare. And the third one is the enhanced strategic autonomy vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the US and China in key data or digital issues, where we do have different concerns in terms of national security or data ethics. And in all those fields, I think the overall objective of policy is set at the European level. There's not much controversial discussion around it, but we don't have something like the common agricultural policy at the EU level for industry. We don't have a common industrial policy. We do have five years of council recommendations and a nice uh, communication from the Commission, but no policy, no legislation and no funding so far. And I think we are in the process of changing that, um, where the German government has actually spearheading, has been spearheading this exercise. Let me make a third point. I think uh, in some in instances we have to become much more specific. If you think about decarbonizing industry after the Paris Agreement uh, and national and sector specific targets, essentially you have to think about how much carbon pricing solves the problem for you and what has to be done on top of that. And here we actually enter the question of how we frame the EU legal framework for state aid, for competition rules, for public infrastructure provision, and how do we coordinate uh, investment strategies by the private and the public sector to make it happen. You can take the example of decarbonizing steel. If you want to have investment in gas or hydrogen-based steel production systems, you need to fix the problem that new technologies yield much higher prices due to the higher costs involved with using gas or hydrogen. If you want to make it happen, you need to think about the promotional schemes that introduce gas and hydrogen in investment planning of firms and that allow operational expenses that are higher afterwards to be um, tackled with and to make it in, into a, a true business case. Uh, there are many similar examples in the electrification of cars or in changing uh, the uh, shape of transportation more generally if you think of long range aviation, um, cruise shipping and all the other issue areas in which uh, technology is not yet uh, ripe or uh, not at uh, costs uh, that uh, make it viable. I think uh, the first point is that um, the, uh, there is uh, at the European level now a pretty strong consensus on what to do in general, but no, uh, not much work on specific policy projects where legislation, funding and other elements are put into place. Again here, the MFR <clears throat> didn't bring the breakthrough but next generation EU provides ample opportunity for promoting some of these policies in much more um, depth uh, and length than so far. So far. Uh, I mentioned only a few buzzwords in that context that are important and will be funded and will be legislated about in, in due course. Think about high performance computing, quantum, quantum uh, computing, 
the promotion of AI, 5G and 6G, the uh, work we have been doing on batteries and microelectronics, which are probably be prolonged, uh, the issue of um, European business to business cloud solutions and Gaia X, uh, on which there's an emerging consensus that we should be doing it, on appropriate software and hardware where for doing digital solutions in accordance with European data protection rules or national security concerns and for autonomy topics in healthcare. Now, these are all uh, issues that are on the agenda that need to be financed, for which there needs to be a clear cut policy framework and which we are will be working on. I think Germany is pushing for that. It's not the auto liberal um, um, state putting brakes onto these de developments. I think it's, it's a very positive development that we are getting there. I think we are closing uh, on that topic is I think we do still have uh, issues with the more complex topics of European value chains in several areas where um, cross-cutting horizontal international projects have to be brought about, uh, in particular in transportation. If you think about autonomous driving in Europe, obviously it should be a single market solution at the minimum. Probably you need to go, to go beyond the EU in terms of infrastructure, data rules, GDPR rules and so on, apart from the sheer technology you want to use. And I think in that sense, we need more of these European missions that allow all the partners you need to get these things done, to collabor collaborate with R&D institutes, uh, companies, and the government uh, providing framework conditions. A similar exercise has to be done in the transition of many mobility uh, areas to uh, either um, hydrogen or electric uh, transmission systems. Again, here you have a big issue of infrastructure, of setting up loading uh, stations and so on, that can either be done publicly or privately, but there has to be a plan for it and uh, some allocation of uh, responsibilities, uh, risks and costs. And that's more complex than rather setting up a national program for support of a certain uh, technology. I think uh, we are in a midst of an interesting transformation in industrial policy that gets us back to uh, projects and missions we had uh, in the immediate post-war period that were uh, at that time a bit simpler. But if you think about it, in the early 50s, thinking about a European aeroplane, about a nuclear industry or uh, similar topics, looked pretty demanding at the time. And the things we are talking to about, to, to, uh, about today are looking uh, pretty demanding today, but we have been there before and we will get it done. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Klaus. So um, well, we have another 20 minutes or so for the discussion and I'd like to uh, hand the floor over back to Rainer for his response. But maybe before that, I mean, I would just like to add one or a few thoughts of myself. Um, so just, I mean, so even this morning I came from Freiburg I was there in a workshop yesterday, so at the Walter Eucken Institute, so basically the guardians of the holy grail of German auto liberalism, okay? And I mean, we talked a little bit about those issues, and I mean, there was a fascinating talk about, um, you know, the history um, of the whole idea, and basically a talk about the future optimism of planning in the 1960s, uh, where basically policymakers were already kind of very keen on planning the economy at that time, for, for the use of information communication technologies and so on. And some of the conclusion occurred to me that order liberalism may have kind of dominated the um, rhetorics of policy discussions, but never the actual politics, right? Mm -hmm. So that there was always industrial policy being conducted. Uh, the rhetorics may have been on this technology neutral side, but I mean, how can you conduct technology neutral policies at some point by making any decisions you're basically uh, shaping also the technology use. So basically it was, I think we've, and Klaus alluded to that as well. I mean, we have in a sense always been doing industrial policy. And so I was asking myself, and maybe you can uh, elaborate on this a bit, what exactly, what specifically do you want Germany to do? And, um, I mean, as you said, I mean, some parts, and Philip uh, talked about it, I mean, some parts, I think we are already doing, right? So the coal exit, I think, is a mission-oriented strategy with very generous funding, uh, the NRD vendor as well. There are other uh, types of strategies that exist, which may not be so generously funded. So the AI strategy had something like 3 billion in funding, which is ridiculously low, but that's going to expand uh, also due to, to COVID. So I think, so my question would be, what exactly uh, are you missing? Is it basically a shift in rhetoric so that you basically openly admit what you're doing and you're not hiding behind 
sort of this this uh, order liberal uh, paradigm, which you then don't really follow in practice. And the last remark on that is, um, I think, I mean, the, to me at least, the key thing is the uh, remarks on finance. I think this is where Europe is really way behind the US when it comes to um, financing risky projects, equity financing, all, all of that. So the question is to me, who is supposed to do that? So you talk a lot about the central bank, but I would say, I mean, the first thing to do would be to kind of complete the capital market in Europe, right? so the banking union, uh, the capital market union, and then maybe set up something like a um, equity fund, a public equity fund to fund risky projects and so on. Um, because at the end, I mean, I don't want a technocratic institution like the ECB to decide on like what projects are to be funded and what projects are not. I think this is the task of policymakers. But I think there, there I very much agree. I would like to hear some more thoughts. What specifically you would you would suggest to uh, overcome this huge gap when it comes to financing constraints for risky projects and missions? So, but please, uh, Adam, you had a lot of issues. Uh, right. for yes. four comments now essentially so you, you you choose what to what to respond on and we then have another round maybe of questions if there's time yeah no yeah thanks so much for for all the comments i, I think they're very rich and uh, from very different directions as well which i really appreciate so i think it also reflects of course your different backgrounds which is really great i think the um, just sort of i might well i might also sort of go you know, from the beginning basically from philip onwards I think it's I think it's really interesting to to hear that uh, that from a policymaker point of view, you're basically saying that because of the the challenges are have become, let's say, so dominant that you can't just sort of focus on one ministry, one you know you, you can't sort of specialize anymore so much that you have to have much more of a coordination, and that's why you you need to you be much more challenge focused. I think that's uh, that's probably true, and that also it's. Uh, it shows that um, as, as many other countries are focusing in a similar way, they're sort of realizing that, that uh, you know, if you look at just the Ministry of Economics or, or, or whatever ministry you have for science and uh, technology, it's not enough to, for them to do the investments and, and support mechanism alone. You need a, a much wider, wider approach. So whether it's a paradigm shift uh, only in, in rhetoric or in substance, I think is, is also the question that probably that Klaus and Jens were, were sort of uh, uh, pointing at and in a, in a report we call it also the stealth in, in industrial policy in Germany that it, it was really under the radar in, in in a sense of rhetoric and maybe especially in the in the in, in the economics profession I think it was very much under the radar for those in the policy making and those in the industry probably it wasn't that much of a surprise actually that there was actually very active industrial policy uh, going on and that's absolutely absolutely true and in that sense it might not actually be that much of a paradigm shift for, for, for Germany it is actually uh, much more about you know talking about it much more openly and perhaps that's um, the reason to have a better discussion about it i think that's already i think a big step forward if you say that yes we are actually really interested in uh, industrial policy that space that is specifically focused on challenges that our society and that's uh, i think it opens up all those avenues to then discuss finance for instance or procurement in, in a more sort of open and also i think more especially when we talk about sort of theories and, and things like that in a more th theoretically diverse setting. So it's not only one type of analytical uh, people or frameworks being discussed, but you have a, a much wider, which is a diverse setting of analytical frameworks, which I think is already a big step forward. Uh, and I think this, uh, my second point would be very much from, um, inspired from Patricia's uh, comments, I think that even if the sort of the mission-oriented uh, policies are not that strong of a, a paradigm shift in German policymaking, I think it is um, making you more aware that that the policymaking itself needs to be changing as well in terms of much more open and collaborative, which I think, uh, as Patricia was was talking about, especially in the, in, in some of the areas in in East Germany, is, is something where you you just don't have those historical structural support um, uh, either in, in, in form of from labor to employers associations to universities and so on and so forth but i think this is something that already again is opens you another very different qualitative different kind of debate and overall i think this uh, uh, what we in our report also focus on capabilities i think it's you can't really underestimate those capabilities in the public but also in other sectors not only to collaborate but really to 
to, to try to implement some of those more mission focused and long term policies, which require a, a you know a different kind of uh, approach, if you if you will, I think. So in that sense, I very much agree that the Germany, you know, you still have a very much expert driven organization. So if you look at the public sector, it's very much an expert driven a bureaucracy. So how do you open that up to a, a a wider and diverse views and settings, and especially in, in those areas that, that perhaps perhaps are economically lagging and, and might not have the um, you know universities or companies to rely on, on taking some of the leading roles in, in those areas. So I think it, this is something that um, that I think is, is very important. I think uh, allows its um, uh, example is, is very interesting. It's a good one here, and and I think from Klaus, I I, I very much agree that. Uh, that there is this um, on the on the European level, there's, there's a strange uh, sort of rhetorical action going on, but not actually much of a ability to create those common markets. You, you look at you mentioned some of the areas like autonomous vehicles and energy, but also you look at healthcare, for instance. There is such an obvious uh, uh, reason to do so, and digital to digitalization being the other one, and and indeed this is where the where the EU is. Uh, is, is being probably a, a problematic, quite a problematic actor. And I think this is where Germany and of course France as well, as we've seen in COVID, can take much more of a leading position, if you will. And then partially, I think you, you can see it happening in digital uh, sphere and, uh, and especially uh, also, I think, in areas where there is sort of strategic, geopolitical security risks. I think GDPR in that sense is actually quite a good uh, beginning of, of EU-wide regulations. And I would very much support that that EU-wide sort of market shaping and common market ideas, uh, in that sense, not that far from or, or the liberal <laughs> ideas are actually quite good. And then so some of the things that we argue in our paper, you need a healthy balance of those uh, market framework conditions and then also public direct investment support as well. So I, I, I very much agree with that as well. Yeah, in terms of Jens's uh, questions around what, what is the concrete thing that, you, you know, Germany good too, I think there is uh, quite a lot to be learned from energy vendor. I think, for instance, if you, if, you, if you try to do the same thing as did in energy vendor over like decades, actually, so it wasn't the KFW alone, it was like, uh, uh, you know, citizen movements, political parties involved. So there's a long-term process. If you think whether you can replicate that, that in digital, for instance, I think it's a, it's a much, you know, it shows you the, the tasks uh, ahead, I think. So I think um, this is where, where I would really really look at is where do we, how can we replicate uh, the energy vendor type of uh, activities in digital, for instance. And as you mentioned, AI, indeed, uh, AI uh, sort of policy that has the same budget as, uh, as DARPA has for one year, which is the US Defense Agency. So obviously, you can't compete on that level of funding. So you, you know, the one thing is to look at much higher levels of funding. But it, it really, so Capabilities in that space, I think, are really key for me. So I would really focus on that kind of capabilities for digital policymaking that can can lead also the EU in terms of EU common market policies, uh, but also wider. Yeah, in terms of financial regulation, I think there is a, a lot of um, work to be done in, uh, in in sort of understanding how both regulators but also central banks can actually, you know, not only you know we don't really talk about direct investment, obviously, or direct, you know technocrats deciding what, where to invest. But it's actually creating those financial instruments and vehicles that then actually can make prices for, for green, green finance cheaper, essentially. So you want to, you want to generate um, those instruments uh, on, a, on a much stronger level. And at the moment, of course, ECB, and well also the Bundesbank, is, is very much focused on price stability. So the, every, all the other mandates, basically, are, are really almost quite impossible. So I think this is, again, I mean, in Germany, ironically, you can really learn from, from yourself. I mean, that's why I mean that the, the panel here is about role model as well. So you can really learn from KFW example and, and, and how to do that in many ways as well. So this was my quick round of uh, uh, comments. Yeah, thank you, Rana. So we have a few more minutes and we have to stop exactly on time because later on, I mean, we're going to have Olaf Scholz and Joe Stiglitz discussing and I mean, they'll so we need fine. to adhere to the, to the schedule. Um, I found it interesting that basically you, you alluded to the energy vendor as kind of the big uh, shiny example of industrial policy because this is probably the most controversial issue because many others within the German debate will consider this as a complete failure and would argue that you could have achieved 
the very same goals at much lower costs, right? But, yeah. but I would like maybe to ask, um, you know, maybe maybe Philip, what's your main takeaway? What will be different in um, tomorrow's politics after today's talk? I mean, what's your main takeaway? <laughs> Well, uh, well, thank you, uh, um, Jens, for try, trying to provoke me a little bit. I mean, I think there was, that was maybe even too much unity on this on this uh, um, panel, um, well, panel, virtual panel. That's very true. Uh, because, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think Klaus Deutsch as well, he said there has always been industrial policy. And if you look a little bit into auto-liberalism, then you can see that obviously there was always a role for the, for the state. Um, Wilhelm Röpke, Alexander Rüstow, um, Franz Böhm, they all had, I mean, obviously they had it was not the auto liberal school so i mean i think there always was was a ro ro role for the state there was always was an industrial policy i think klaus deutsch made, made that uh, very uh, clear as well of course we do need a collaborative uh, approach i mean uh, i mean in my view i think we already have it we can of course try to improve it we always have to try to improve it and i, I listen very well to of, of, to, to to this, this suggestion here suggestion so so I, th I think we can improve but that's exactly what we what we are trying to do with this the structural the coal commission and the structural change process it's a coll collaborative um, process and then my argument was well and that's actually not so different i mean i wouldn't call it a mission oriented uh, approach i would would call it a problem oriented approach we look what are the main challenges and we have to respond to them and yes there might be the case that we need that does the, the classical economic um, uh, economic arguments for state intervention maybe they are a little bit stronger maybe the, the case for it is bigger because we have digitalization with network effects we have uh, energy vendor with external costs the, the challenge to internalize them and the geopolitical changes and and therefore i mean what will be what will be different after uh, after today i think i have gained more more insight and more more arguments i think to 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 support uh, actually many of, I'm not saying that we are, we, are, we are without fault, but many of the policies um, um, we, are, we are conducting, and when Peter Altmaier actually proposed his industrial strategy, he was, many laughed at him, and now, I mean, Klaus Deutsch, there are a lot of instruments, you mentioned them, important projects of common European interest, batteries, microelectronics, we are setting them up, we are setting up battery uh, factories in, in Germany, we are actually... Um, collaborating with other european partners and and therefore i think um, i think we're continuing on this uh, road but with a better theoret theoretical background excellent thanks so maybe we have like um Pat patricia and, 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 and klaus if you could just uh, some final thoughts but please not more than two minutes because we have to stop on time so patricia yeah i'm very i'm very happy that uh, that you just said that uh, the the administration and the government is already collaborative. Uh, I think to a certain degree it's right. And I think the Coal Commission showed that this is possible. Without them, we wouldn't have the consensus for the coal exit, uh, leave alone whether it was necessary to have a, uh, an expert commission or not. And I think it was very important. But my point was precisely that this was a collaborative discourse which, which finally came to a consensus. And then once the Coal Commission finished its work, there is no process going on which sort of binds the the bundes uh, in the federal level together with the lender level together with the you know local level in order to have uh, things like you know long-term strategies for a region how does the loudest want to look like in 30 uh, years and then you would have a normative background from which you can judge which project to finance in which you don't and to my mind we don't have a process which is subtle enough to have a sort of a how can I say, a, a structural change, uh, which is, uh, if you want to call it mission driven or whatever, or problem driven, I don't, I don't really care. What I care about is that, the, how can I say, it's a very old fashioned idea to think that the sum of the project finance is then the structural change. That cannot be. We have to think from the future backwards. And precisely after the Coal Commission, this kind of a discourse and this kind of a um, the sort of process uh, to think about that was missing. That's all. Thanks, Klaus, if you could give us your final thoughts. Yeah, maybe uh, four quick points on the role of finance. I think uh, there's agreement that promotional or policy banks have a role to play, in particular in the construction sector, in energy, in uh, local investment, and in many other areas. I think it's not controversial. 
Uh, it's also, I think, uh, quite clear that uh, sustainable finance as a regulatory uh, uh, approach to address non-financial reporting is not in itself a game changer. It's a useful uh, additional instrument if, if it's at play, but uh, the key issue is how to turn uh, investment projects in the green field into viable uh, business cases themselves. And therefore you need tax uh, changes, you need uh, state aid rules, and you need um, true uh, you know, uh, MBA faculties looking at technologies running down the cost curve and uh, thinking about what to do and how much uh, support you actually need to get the most efficient uh, bang for the buck in, uh, in mitigating uh, emissions. What I'm really critical of is, is one point in your paper, uh, which is the role of central banks. I think they shouldn't get into structural policies by their purchase, purchasing programs. I think they should roughly buy the market in order to achieve their um, shadow interest rate objectives and not get into fine tuning sectors and um, instruments. We have a big debate with uh, them on the CSPP and the PEPP and all the rest of it. But I think in general, the ECB is doing fine and they can also buy green bonds from the government. I don't care, right? But they shouldn't get into a structural policy of the central bank. That's something for governments to do, actually. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think we leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, Rainer, for the very nice paper and presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia, Philip, and Klaus for the discussion. Um, and I'll just pass it on back to uh, Thomas for the next uh, round. Thank yes. you. Bye. Thank you all um, for this excellent discussion, which we very probably will continue. A lot of aspects open and you will circulate the study so that uh, we have certainly other points to discuss. There was some one question on online and we will pass it to the uh, panelists uh, so that they can hopefully uh, and will answer directly.